We begin our service today with the lighting of the Advent wreath by Pastor and Lucy Gay. We light the first candle, reminding us of God's promise of peace on earth. A scripture reading from Psalm 72. Give the gift of wise rule to the king, O God, the gift of just rule to the crown prince. May he judge your people rightly. Be honorable to your meek and lowly. Let the mountains give exuberant witness. Shape the hills with the contours of right living. Please stand up for the poor. Help the children of the needy. Come down hard on the cruel tyrants. Outlast the sun, outlive the moon. Age after age after age. Be rainfall on cut grass. Earth refreshing rain showers. Let righteousness burst into blossom. And peace abound until the moon fades to nothing. Oh God. We remember that you sent Jesus to the whole world, and especially to the poor and those in need. We remember that Jesus healed the sick, comforted those who mourn, and went out of his way to love the little children. Lord, may the light of this second candle, as it dispels the darkness around it, help help to remind us that we are to dispel the darkness of sickness, poverty, injustice, and suffering all around us.
I was going to be down below there, just trying to be a little more intimate, uh, but just was reminded that uh, if I don't use the microphone, it won't pick up. We record our services now, and so that they can be sent to people who are uh, shut-ins and unable to be here. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm speaking here on this mic for that reason. So we, uh, today, on the second Sunday in Advent, uh, always come to John the Baptist. Uh, we can't get to Christmas without getting through John. And so we look at the lectionary readings, the gospel lectionary readings uh, from Matthew 3, which uh, bring us right into the heart of John's ministry. So listen to God's word. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. And then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor, for I tell you, Abraham is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I am is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his weed into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. For every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Perhaps it is not surprising that uh, there has never been a line of John the Baptist Christmas cards. Can you imagine what they might look like if there were such a line? You know, on the front of one card, there would be a gaunt, emaciated man with straggly beard and grizzly shirt looking out at you with sunken eyes and, and pointing at you with a bony finger with, I want you. And you'd open up the card and it's, I want you to repent. Or worse, what about a card with a bunch of snakes slithering out of the fire with the cheery message, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath that is to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Not much of a market for such cards, I imagine. Every year, just as the season is getting into high gear, just as we've gotten the Christmas tree and we put the crash out and we've gotten the lights up and the out-of-state gifts are mailed, just as we're really gearing up for the season, we meet John the Baptist probably the last person we'd want to see. John pointing at us, thundering like an Old Testament prophet, ripping off a tongue lashing the likes of which we have never heard, seeming to promote a brand of religion we thought we had long since abandoned, harsh, judgmental, uncompromising. Was it curiosity, do you think, that brought the crowds out to hear his preaching? That may have motivated maybe those Pharisees and Sadducees, and he reserves the harshest words for them. But the people of all Jerusalem and all Judea, we read, had found their way out into the wilderness, and John must have certainly struck something of a responsive chord. For many, we are told, responded with repentance and baptism. John's message, searing though it is, apparently taps 
into something deep within us. John's judgment comes with a certain amount of urgency. It's not so much that he is out to get people as he is to announce the coming of one who calls on us to decide now who is on the side of life and who isn't. God's kingdom is coming, you know, and there's no time to dither. If you're not bearing fruit, if there's no life in you for the Lord of life to reach, then you're in the way. The chaff gets, that gets burned, like the chaff that gets burned, like a barren apple tree that is cut down so a new one can flourish in its place. As John understands his job, there's no room for excuses either. Credentials, you know, who your daddy is, you know, and, and that's really just a, a, a translation of what the text actually says. The text says, you know, don't presume to say we have Abraham as our father. In other words, don't presume to think that your ancestors are going to do it for you. You know, who your daddy is means nothing in this situation. And don't count on the fact that your grandfather was a big contributor either. And the fact that your brother was a 30-year elder doesn't matter. There are no coattails here. There's only one question. Are you bearing fruit or not? Now, despite the fact that John was apparently tapping into something, I don't know anyone who relishes judgment. When I was a child, I remember how much easier it was to take a tongue lashing or even a spanking. You know, in those days, it wasn't viewed as child abuse when I was growing up. But in, in, it was much easier to take a tongue lashing than it was to hear real words of judgment from my parents. The worst thing they could say was, Rich, your behavior really disappointed us. It wasn't what we expected of a child in this family. Oh, that hurt and that lingered because I was exposed, I was stripped bare. I understood with glaring clarity that I had fallen short. It was much easier to endure a spanking. John's graphic message brings home the truth that the gospel involves something more than a bland message we could hear anywhere. You know, a kind of a, God is nice, we are nice, Therefore, you should be nice to everyone. You know, we can be content sometimes with religion in small doses, controlled, sensible, eminent, eminently acceptable in the best of places, but kind of bland and boring. But in contrast, you see, John absolutely knocks the socks off of us. He sets our teeth on edge. His message is, a, is that of a radical, radically transforming God who wants to pick us up, dust us off, throw us all around, and send us out to do his work. Unsettling in Matthew's account of John's judgment is this picture of unquenchable fire, isn't it? Fire in the Bible almost always is associated with the presence of God. You know, think of Moses encountering the burning bush or or the pillar of fire leading the people of Israel through the wilderness, or, or the fiery presence on the top of Mount Sinai when Moses received the Ten Commandments. Fire can be a, a fearsome and, and dangerous thing, of course, but fire in the biblical setting is not always a destructive thing. The Bible speaks of God being like a refiner's fire, purifying metal, turning it into gold, or like a potter who uses the fire of the kiln to turn that mushy clay into a treasured and useful vessel. Fire does not always have to be destructive. It can be the fire of transformation, lighting us up, changing us, transforming us to be more fully in the image of Jesus. And this is the fire with which Jesus baptizes us. Note how the tone of John changes abruptly when he starts to talk about Jesus. This firebrand who is slashing and burning his way through the crowds gathering in the wilderness of Judea suddenly becomes humble, quiet. I am not even worthy to carry the Messiah's sandals, he says. Whatever transformation I am urging is nothing compared with the kind of transformation Jesus is anticipating. Now, John, of course, doesn't actually know Jesus at this point. And when, in fact, Jesus comes, with a very different spirit than John's spirit, still calling for repentance, but in a way which is, is healing and uplifting and encouraging rather than so harsh and forbidding, John is not at all sure that that is what he was expecting. He was expecting somebody more like him. 
You know, are you the one who is to come? He asks Jesus. But for both John and Jesus, the call to repentance is a call to deep personal discovery. It's a matter of having one's illusions, one's masks, one's rationalizations stripped away. And there is something both compelling and foreboding, threatening about that. I'm always a little surprised to discover that a lot of us, perhaps most of us, certainly it includes me, accomplished though we may be, have within us sometimes still a certain fear that somehow we're going to be found out. You know, that we're going to be discovered for not being quite as competent or as fully put together or as good as our image projects. I've had conversations like that with a CEO of a large insurance company. I've had conversations like that with a vice president of a major publishing house in New York, a minister of a, a booming and growing church, all of whom admitted this nagging uncertainty that maybe somehow they'd be exposed. You know, I've discovered a lot of us, maybe even most of us, are anxious that we'll be unmasked as a bit of a fraud in over our heads, struggling, not nearly as good a person as we'd like others to see. And you see, God's judgments have a way of unmasking us at a deep level, of, of having us be known for who we are, down to the core, having any pretense stripped away, having the light on us turn so brightly that every nook and cranny of our being is up for examination. It's standing without our armor before God. And although there is great relief in knowing that truth, it is also scary. No wonder we'd rather move away from John the Baptist as quickly as we can run. Maybe the only people who look forward to that kind of exposure are those who have no doubts about their goodness. I'm not sure, because frankly, I just don't really know anybody like that. <laughs> when we look at this disconcerting Advent text so full of fire and judgment, we have to remember that yes, John brings judgment, and it sounds awfully harsh, but John is not the judge. He is the last of the Old Testament prophets, wanting to wake us up, to alert us, to prepare us, but the one who ultimately confronts us as we stand at the dock, as we sit at the defense table, is Jesus, the one to whom John points. And he brings the same message of repentance and transformation as does John, but he is the judge, Jesus is the judge, as Barbara Brand Taylor puts it, whose chambers are the chambers of the compassionate heart. Everything about our salvation depends finally not on our own goodness, but on the goodness of the judge who has pledged his presence, his help, his love. Before him, it is comforting to know the way we really are, to know the whole truth about ourselves, and to yield to his determination to refine and transform us with the fire and the Holy Spirit. We no longer have to worry about how good or bad we are. We don't always have to be in control. We don't have to be God. We don't have to keep up any false confidence in our own total self-sufficiency or our own ultimate goodness because we have confidence in God's goodness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. God is coming in Christ and does not need to be feared. He can be welcomed. He does not come with the fire of destruction, but with the fire of transformation, a burning within which seeks to shape and refine us. I wonder sometimes, though, whether faith has gotten stale for some of us. Are we going through the motions, showing up, out of duty rather than out of desire. It happens, I know, and there are dry spells for most of us. And when that happens, the hope is in this season that this Advent fire might ignite us once again. Advent is a yearly opportunity to be reminded that God never gives up on us. No matter where we are or what we have done, it's never too late for God to change our lives, to wipe away our sinful desires, to our selfish ways, and to replace them 
with the fruit that befits repentance. There's a lot to do to get ready for Christmas. And frankly, I enjoy and I celebrate all of it. I, I look forward to writing cards and putting up the lights, which I fortunately got up yesterday before the snow came, and decorating the tree and buying gifts for those I love and visiting family and watching the TV specials. I love it all. December 25th is coming again, no matter what. Still, at the same time, as we prepare for Christmas, we can prepare for the coming of Christ again into our hearts. We prepare by remembering the reason for the season. We prepare by confessing our sins and affirming that though God knows us through and through without veneer or illusion, God loves us still. We prepare by letting the flame of Christ unite us and transform us from the inside yet again because we remember that this is a lifelong process. It's not a one and done, one time and done, despite the name of our campaign here. It has to be done again and again. We prepare by going even to the wilderness and knowing that whatever we do, wherever we go, Christ, Emmanuel, goes with us. Prepare the way of the Lord, repent, for the kingdom of God is coming near. Thanks be to God who gives us this victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We would invite you to join now in a, a time of prayer. Um, particularly hope that you will keep the uh, Toxopaeus family in your prayers. As most of you know, Al died on Monday and his service was on Thursday. We need, they would appreciate your ongoing prayers. So let us join in prayer. Gracious God, we rejoice that you have not chosen to reside only in houses of brick and stone and wood, but you, you also choose to dwell in the fragile tent of the human heart. We rejoice that you have chosen to be so close to us to reveal yourself in the compassion and wisdom of our brothers and sisters. We rejoice that you even created us, saints in your image, and you invited us to be incarnations of your love. O oh God of all seasons and all senses, give us the grace to experience richly the special meaning of this season of Advent, this period of preparation and waiting. Help us to rest quietly in your presence, to be expectant, so that we may receive the gifts we need and so become the gift that others need. We anticipate your presence, your Emmanuel, the hope of God within us, so grant us the courage to risk allowing you to ignite us from the inside out that we might be transformed by your goodness. Give us the courage to risk giving birth to your presence in our world in the face of whatever apathy and anger and indifference there is, even in the face of those who may deny your existence. In this season of expectation, we pray for those who do not know you, who have not confessed you as Lord and Savior or let you into their heart. Make all that we know bold to take the risk to allow you, O Lord, into their hearts. And where there are those whose faith has grown cold, where the gospel has become a matter of ho-hum, to be taken or left in the face of other things which seem so much more pressing, kindle in them a fire, an excitement, a vision, of why this is such powerful good news. Confident of your presence, O oh Lord, we are bold to bring our intercessions. We pray for those in the hospital, for Gary Belcher, the aftermath of his stroke. We pray for healing and wholeness for him as he goes through rehab. And we pray for Roger Oates in the aftermath of his surgery. We pray that his healing might be complete as well. We pray for the family of Altoxopaeus in the time of his death this week. Bring them your comfort and your peace as only you can provide. We pray, O oh Lord, for mission partners, 
We pray for those for whom this season is difficult, those who may be alone, who are missing a loved family member for the first time this Christmas. Somehow bring your tidings of comfort and joy into their lives as well. Oh Lord, we pray for Carolyn Rutherford's mother as she has surgery this week. And pray for Anne Stein for healing and strength. We give you thanksgiving for the life and witness of Nelson Mandela. For that witness of justice and reconciliation. Oh Lord, we know there are many other prayers in our hearts. Hear and answer them according to your wisdom. This we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Let us now present our tithes and our offerings, remembering the words of our Lord Jesus, who said it is more blessed to give than to receive.
Good and gracious God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we thank you and praise you for all the blessings you bring to our lives. Use now these, our offerings, and our very lives to do your work. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 